Fundamentally, Zen practice is a very simple activity. Just sitting up straight and breathing, paying attention to where you are and what you're doing. Physically, we may have developed habits that aren't helpful, that don't support uh, meditation practice. When you take any child and you sit them on the ground, they're able to sit with their bum on the ground, their knees hit the ground, and their backs are nice and straight. All of us are like that when we're born. But as we grow up, from about the age of five, we start to sit in chairs, and the hip, which is fundamentally a ball and socket joint, starts behaving like a hinge and only moving along one line, and it stops opening up. We feel this later when we go to sit down on the floor and our legs won't open. Sitting without the knees supported or rooted on the ground is really difficult. You have to hold up the weight of your legs with the strength of your buttocks and your lower back. Your upper back comes into play to counterbalance it and the whole experience ends up being uncomfortable and even painful. So there's lots of things that you can do to develop the flexibility of your hip. It's there to begin with. Yoga is a great way of exercising and uh, developing that flexibility. But to start with, you don't need to have that flexibility. We'll get into some of the postures and how to sit on the floor. But first, I'm going to talk about how to sit in a chair so that you can get started right away. Allow me to introduce the chair. The first thing I'd like you to notice about the chair, which is pretty standard in most chairs, is that the front edge where your knees are is actually a little bit higher than the back. What happens with this is when you sit on it, it forces you to throw your weight back into the back of the chair. It undermines the fundamental strength of your lower back and it completely takes your lower body out of the picture. On top of that, if you're a tall person like I am, and even for short people, because this is higher, it actually causes the abdomen to compress, which is exactly what we don't want when we're doing sitting meditation. So the way that you can really uh, adjust this or compensate for it is by using a cushion. We have several kinds. This round one is called a Zafu, and it's really a, a Zen practitioner's bread and butter. Zen practice is, can be difficult mentally, emotionally, and developing it into a regular practice can be quite challenging. Any excuse not to sit can become all the excuse you need not to continue. For me, when I started out, not having a cushion was uh, enough for me to not sit in any given day. Oh, I've got to roll up that cushion. Oh, I've got to arrange my space. That's all it takes to just be put off a practice. So go out and get yourself a good cushion to start with. Uh, it's the most important thing uh, to start. So for sitting in a chair, what you want to do is you just can put your cushion on top of the chair like so. And then rather than sitting fully back in the chair, sit forward so that your back isn't resting on the back of the chair, but you're using your muscles to actually support you. The second thing that you really want to pay attention to is making sure that your feet are solidly planted on the ground in front of you so that you have this tripod of stability. Once you've got that established, everything else from the waist up is exactly the same as if you were sitting on the ground. If in, in fact, if you imagine just cutting me off at the knees, I look just like I'm sitting on the ground. And that's exactly what you want in your uh, posture when you're sitting in a chair. So we'll just go to the ground and I'll go over the rest of the body from there. So coming down onto the floor, there are several postures that you can take up using a cushion that provide an excellent seat for meditation. The first and probably the easiest is called Seiza, is a kneeling posture. So to do it, you take this Zafu, your cushion, and you just place it between your ankles and sit back onto the cushion. You can open up your knees as wide as you like. The wider they're spread, the more stability that you're going to have from side to side. The most important thing to remember in any sitting postures is that you want to create a stable tripod to give you a base for your sitting. What this means is that you want to make sure that both of your knees are solidly planted in the ground and that your tailbone has a solid root. The Seiza posture 
provides this naturally because you're kneeling on the ground. There's no way to kneel without having your knees planted on the ground. Okay? So once you've got this posture, everything else from the waist up is exactly the same as every other posture. So I'm going to show a couple others before I go any further. The next posture that you can try is called Burmese. And to do this, looking at your cushion, you want to be sitting, anytime you're sitting on the top of a zafu, you don't want to be sitting squarely in the middle of the cushion. You want to make sure that you're just sitting on the forward edge so that the, the circle of the cushion is not going to cut across your sciatic nerve and cause your feet to go to sleep. So to sit in the Burmese posture, what you do is you just place your cushion down here like so, sitting on the forward edge of it. You just place one foot in front of you like so, the other foot in front of it like that. Again, you want to make sure that both of your knees are solidly planted on the ground, otherwise you're not going to be stable for the sit. Now it's quite possible that you could almost get there, that one of your knees or both of your knees are going to be up off of the ground, and you shouldn't be discouraged by that. You can just take some support cushions like this. If one of your knees is up off the ground, you can take one, one or two, however many you need. You just put it underneath the knee so that that knee is able to root into it so that it has some support. If both of your knees are up off of the ground and you want to sit in the, in the Burmese posture, you can just put one or two, however many you need. The bottom line is you want to make sure that those knees are supported so that you're able to actually relax, you're able to settle into the posture as you're doing your sitting meditation. The Burmese posture is fundamentally a half posture, which means that it's a little bit out of balance. One foot is further forward than the other. So if you want to sit in this posture, you want to make sure that you're alternating which leg is in front from period to period. Okay, so you sit with the left foot in front one time. The next time you sit down, you just want to reverse that so that the other leg is in front, like so. Okay? Postures like half lotus or full lotus are great for sitting meditation practice, but for most people, they're physically too difficult. If you're interested in learning more about half lotus or full lotus postures, I strongly recommend that you connect with a teacher who can actually give you hands-on advice about how your posture is developing. You do not want to force yourself into half lotus or full lotus posture before your hips have opened up enough to do it. What this does is it forces the knees to twist and it destroys the cartilage inside the knee joint. That causes long-term damage and physical pain in walking later on in life. The more care you take in developing your posture and opening your hips, the stronger your meditation posture is going to be, but we just don't have time to uh, go through all of that in the scope of this video. Once you've got your legs under you, we can look at the rest of the body in meditation. The back is the next part that we really want to look at. Uh, if you just put your hands on the tops of your thighs and press the chest up, lifting out of the waist, what you find is if you take your hand and put it on the small of your back, the lower back scoops in. This will drive a lot of tension into the upper middle back and that can really become painful over the long term in sitting meditation. So what we want to do is straighten the back and take a lot of the tension out of the middle back. The way that you do this is that if you imagine that your hips or your pelvic girdle is like a wagon wheel, you just want to roll the wagon wheel back just a little bit so that the tip of the pelvis comes up. You can feel the lower abdominal muscles come into play and if you put your hand on the small of your back, you'll feel that it comes straight. You should feel solid, stable through your core this is like the trunk of a tree. It gives you a lot of strength and stability in your sitting posture. Okay? The upper body, the upper chest, you want to make sure that it's open, that the collarbones open wide, that the shoulder bones roll back, the shoulder blades drawing down the spine. Okay? A lot of the time in our day-to-day -day lives, 
we tend to allow everything to sort of cave in. We want to protect our hearts. We like to sort of walk around like we're protecting a football from being taken away from us. This leads us to really have a hunched posture. So when we're doing our sitting meditation, this isn't really what we're going for. We want to make sure that that posture is nice and open. If you practice yoga, what we're doing in sitting meditation fundamentally is practicing a mountain posture while we're sitting down. So we want to have that chest forward. Keep your heart in the practice. The shoulders are back, the shoulder blades running down the spine, the chest is forward. The arms form a circle with the right hand on the bottom, the left hand over top, about the middle knuckles overlapping. The thumbs should form a nice round circle with the hands. Not a squishy pancake, not the pagoda, but a nice round circle, as if you're holding the moon in the palm of your hands. It's not a, a grinding pressure, uh, it's just enough to hold a piece of paper between your thumbs if you were to put one there. If your thumbnails are changing color while you're holding your hands in this posture, you're pressing too hard. The center of the body is two finger widths below your navel. It's called the hara in Japanese. So if you just find your belly button, you measure two fingers below it, and this is what you want at the center of your hand posture, the center of your mudra. So if you just put your thumbs together, that, they should be right about at the level of your navel and your hands just down underneath. If you're sitting in the seiza kneeling posture or in the Burmese posture, chances are that you're going to need to hold your hands up a little bit. Otherwise, when they slide down to where they hit something, your shoulders will roll forward and your posture will start to decompensate forward as you continue to sit. When you're holding your hands up into the, to the appropriate height, you want to make sure that you're holding them up from the elbows and from the wrists and not from the shoulders pulling up like this. Okay. Moving on to the head. You want to make sure that your head is on straight. Along with the habit that we develop of hunching over, we develop the habit of sort of doing the vulture with the neck. So what we want to do is as we straighten up our back posture, we also want to draw the chin in so that the back of the neck is straight. You want to lift with the crown of the head. Many people talk about there being a, a rope or a string attached to the crown of your head and, and uh, suspending you from the ceiling. I find that's a really painful kind of image. So I like to continue the image of using a tree. You've got your stable foundation with your legs, which are the roots of the tree that reach down into the ground, providing you with stability and strength. You have the core of the tree, the trunk of the tree, which provides you with stability, strength, and balance. And then with the upper body, with your head and neck, it's like the branches of the tree which are reaching up into the sky for light and warmth and air. Okay, So there's kind of a dynamic pressure, a dynamic tension between the lower and the upper body so that the, the, the feeling that you should have when you're sitting is one of vibrancy. It's very uh, alive. Okay, The chin is tucked in, as I said. The mouth is closed with the teeth together, not clenched tightly, just resting uh, on one another. Use the tongue to fill as much of your mouth as possible. So if you just take the tip of your tongue and rest it on the back of your front teeth, press your tongue forward into your mouth so that it fills your mouth, and then just swallow. What that does is it creates a suction which gives a cue to your body that you don't need any more saliva. So you won't be swallowing the whole time that you're doing your sitting meditation. You won't be choking on your own spit. Having said that, uh, if you're nervous or if you're really busy thinking, your body tends to produce a lot of saliva and so you may be swallowing. Uh, one thing to remember is that your swallowing is always much louder to you than it is to everybody else that you might be sitting with. Obviously, with the mouth being closed, we're going to breathe through our nose. I'll come back to the breath in a minute. In Zen meditation, the eyes are cast down just in front of us, about two or three feet or about a 45 degree angle from your head. Um, in different kinds of meditation, you may close your eyes. But in Zen meditation, we want to keep all of the senses open. We're not closing anything off and we're not indulging in anything. And this goes for all of the senses when we're doing Zen meditation. What we'll notice is that 
our tendency is always to move towards the things that we really like and away from the things that we really don't like. And this goes in all of our sense fields, including our visual sense. So using sight as an example, as we're sitting, just cast down in front of us, we want to soften the gaze. Our tendency with vision is to either focus extremely uh, on one thing, to be looking at it, or if we're not doing that, is to shut it off by closing our eyes. So what we want to do with vision is we just want to keep them open gently. We want to soften the center of our field of vision so we're not focusing on anything. And we want to allow the peripheral vision to open up as much as possible so that we can take in the full field of vision without discrimination as we're doing our sitting meditation. The same goes with the sense of hearing. When we hear something that we like, like a bird singing or a bell ringing, we move towards it. We want to listen to it. When we hear something that we don't like, like a car horn or a child crying, we tend to move away from it, to separate from it. So with all of the senses, we want to have this same feeling of opening, allowing everything without choosing the things that we like and moving towards them, without finding the things that we don't like and moving away from them. This isn't a fixed place. We never find a place where it's perfectly locked in. It's more like driving, where we have these sort of two limitations. And if we're just paying attention, we're always sort of moving between the two lines. So if we find that we're getting focused on something, if we're you know, getting attached to something, fixating something, ah, become aware of that. And just backing up, we bring our, our sensory awareness back into this neutral, open place. If we find that we're pushing away from something or trying to avoid something, ah, closing our eyes, uh, we just become aware of that, bring ourselves back to neutral, bring, us, bring ourselves back to this center position. The same thing goes for the physical posture of meditation as well. The idea isn't to lock ourselves into this uh, rigid posture, but to allow ourselves to be soft and organic. As we sit, you're going to find that your posture bends or twists, that your thumbs become flatter or that your thumbs come apart entirely. And it's not to make this into a matter of good and bad, but to use it to bring about more awareness. When our thumbs go flat or when they come apart, becoming aware of it, we just bring them back into a nice round circle. When we find ourselves sitting off in a posture that's not straight, just becoming aware of it and bringing ourselves back to neutral, bringing ourselves back to the center and starting again. The most complex of all of the senses that we deal with in meditation is, of course, the mind. In the teachings of Buddhism, the mind is considered the sixth sense organ. Thought, emotion, images are its object. And as we sit, certainly we can find a balance, a middle ground with the rest of our senses. But the mind is a bit more tricky. It's a lot easier to get caught up in a thought either liking it and getting carried away, indulging in it, or really finding it difficult and uncomfortable and trying to avoid it. The same goes with emotions that come up. If we get angry or we feel anger coming up while we're sitting, we want to, oh, I'm meditating right now, I don't want to be angry, or I'm feeling sad, oh, and I should be feeling happy because I'm meditating. It's very easy to get into a conflict or a polar relationship with our thoughts with our emotions and with images that come up during sitting meditation. The practice with the mind is exactly the same as the practice with every other sense while we're doing sitting meditation, which is to bring ourselves back to center, to bring ourselves back to this middle ground and uh, keep going. The way that we do this is through using the breath in Zen meditation. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about how to breathe while we're doing Zen practice. As I've said before, our mouth is closed, so we're going to start by breathing through the nose. In our day-to-day -day lives, we tend to breathe very strongly into the chest. This is very invigorating, and it really helps to stimulate the intellectual mind, which is great. But for sitting meditation, we want to allow this to settle down a little bit. You want to relax the upper respiratory muscles as much as possible, and allow yourself to breathe fully into the abdomen. Um, 
This same spot just below your navel, your hara, is where you want the breath to be motivated from, both in breathing in and breathing out. If you imagine, instead of pushing the air in through your nose, but instead drawing it from your abdomen so that your diaphragm acts like a bellows. So as you're inhaling, your abdomen expands outwards. And as you exhale, not just allowing the air to flap out of you, just fall out of you, but motivating that breath again from just below the navel. So after we, after we breathe in, breathing out, the abdomen contracts. Breathing in, breathing out. Now for the purposes of demonstration, I'm exaggerating this a bit. You don't need to breathe any uh, more sort of slowly or deeply or more spiritually or more zen or anything like this. It's a very natural breath and you're just paying attention to how it is that you're breathing, making sure that the upper chest is relaxed and bringing that awareness, bringing that um, intention into your lower abdomen. Just so. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use the breath as an anchor for our mind. Because again, as I said, the mind is the, the one sense that we have the most trouble with. It's the one where we get attached or we want to get away from. So what we do is a simple exercise of counting the breath. So that as we're breathing in, we simply count one. As we breathe out, you count two. Breathing in, we count three. Breathing out, count four. And we continue until we reach 10. And then we come back to one and start again. Now, if you find that you get to 14, 25, 36, it's not a problem, it's not wrong, but we recognize that we've hopped on sort of autopilot and we've just continued. And usually what's happened is we've started to count and think about something or and be distracted by our thoughts or and be trying to fight off whatever emotion has arisen. Just recognize that we've gone past 10 and come back to one. If you find yourself at three, four, I wonder what I'm going to have for lunch. I wonder what so-and-so is doing later. Oh, I forgot what number I'm on. Again, just come back to one and start again. This exercise is not about becoming a successful breath counter, and it doesn't matter how many times that you're able to count from one to 10. This practice is about bringing awareness to where we are with our thoughts and our emotions. When we find ourselves being distracted, that moment that the awareness that we have fallen off, the awareness that we have lost the count is of the greatest importance. Coming back, to the task at hand, coming back to this activity of counting the breath is what we're trying to develop, to cultivate this fundamental awareness of where we are and what we're doing and allowing ourselves to come back to center and resume from a, a grounded and central uh, balanced place. So those are the basics for developing a stable and consistent Zen meditation practice. The greatest piece of advice that I can offer you is to not try to go too far too fast. In the long run, it provides a better foundation for you to start by doing just two minutes or five minutes and do it regularly every single day than it is to do 40 minutes once a week. The idea here is to try to integrate a regular practice into your life that can sustain you rather than to make it into something special that you do every once in a while. Meditation practice is gradual. Meditation practice makes changes over time, but in order for it to do that, you really need to practice it on a stable and consistent schedule.